Um, just so beautiful from, there we go, got the recording going, uh, from our guest speaker today. I know there's a family link there as well. But welcome to our first monthly discovery dialogue with the Capital Institute. Our topic is from crypto winter to refi spring, steering technology towards the service of life. So just really excited to be bringing this topic to you today with John Fullerton, as always, and our two guest speakers, Jessica Grumman and Charlie Klesner. So we have over 40 countries represented here today that signed up and over 300 people. So what a privilege just to, um, just to be here. We have some new names and some familiar faces coming through as the Zoom was opening up. So just thank you for those who already have put their name in and where you're from. We do want to know where you're calling in from. So thank you. I have the privilege of welcoming our guest speakers, Charlie Cle um, Kleesner and Jessica, as I spoke about earlier. I had the privilege of speaking with them earlier this week and just such beautiful, genuine people. It was wonderful to be able to be in a space coming from such diverse backgrounds and making that link around regeneration where, where I said, oh, well, I come from an agricultural background and soil um, where we have technology. It just feels like such, such polar opposites, but yet we gathered in the same space. So just beautiful how this regeneration brings us together. So Charlie Klesner is a former Silicon Valley senior technology executive and is now an impact investor. He was the CTO at Araba and worked for Steve Jobs at Next and is associated with the Silicon Valley Blockchain Society. He sees impact investing not as an intellectual experience, but an expression of who he really is. Jessica Grumman is in her current role as Director of Digital Strategy and Innovation at Intentional Futures. Jessica works with organizations to develop long-term innovation strategies that align economics, societal and environmental benefits. Through previous work, past clients range from large, large brands, including Google, Microsoft, Intel, Pandora, um, to an array of think tanks, media companies, and several startups. Their full bios are on our website, so if you haven't had the opportunity to read them yet, please do um, do so. But just looking forward to diving into this topic with you all today. And I'm going to hand it over to John, who's going to do a little bit more of an introduction, and then we'll jump into our dialogue. But before I do so, I just wanted to just give you a flow of today as well. So John will speak, and then we'll dive into the dialogue. And then we're also wanting to create space at the end for questions. So please do stay with us to the end. Uh, this will be done through raising of hands. So I'm sure everyone's familiar with a little emoji at the bottom of your screen. If you're not, just check it out. You'll find it at the bottom right. And yeah, so we'll, we'll take questions that way. And then we do know and hope there are going to be far more questions than we could ever answer in this time. So we will um, also share a link where we can stay connected after this call. But I think that's it. I'll hand it over to John. Right, great. Thanks, Rachel. And, and welcome, everyone. Great to, um, to see all you. Many familiar faces, many new faces. So uh, thanks for joining us today. Um, before we dive into it, I just wanted to share the, the idea behind these monthly dialogues. Um, so, some of you who know me and, and my work will remember that I used to write a monthly blog going back to the beginning of Capital Institute. And the idea was to take some event, some current event, that some, something that was topical in the mainstream uh, media that was relevant to the world of economics and finance, and talk about it through a regenerative lens. And um, uh, I did that for, um, gosh, close to a decade. And uh, the truth is when the Trump wave hit the United States, the media became dominated with the craziness. And I found it harder and harder to engage in those issues um, through my regenerative thinking. And, so I, I sort of petered out on the blog, but um, uh, we then launched this course last year, the, the course on uh, regenerative economics. And we introduced this idea of a discovery dialogue as, a, as, as one of the core components of the course. For those of you that, that participate in the course, you'll know what I'm, I'm uh, talking about. And we found, and, and I think everyone who engaged in it found these dialogues very 
um, generative, if you will. And so just for those who are not familiar with dialogue, um, the word actually di dia means through, not to. So a dialogue is not two people in conversation. Dialogue is, is through and logos or meaning. So to create meaning through conversation. And so our, our goal of this dialogue is that not only Jessica and Charlie and I will, will be in dialogue and we'll all come out of this with some insights that none of us have coming into this dialogue, but all of you will participate in that experience uh, as best we can in the context of Zoom boxes and, and Zoom screens, and that the dialogue hopefully will continue beyond this one hour session. Um, the, the second thing I wanna say is that, you know, for those of you who know me, I'm, I sort of lean on the Luddite side of the technology spectrum. Uh, I'm not anti-technology by any means, but I'm certainly not um, at the cutting edge of technology. But the, the topic today is both in the news and I think profoundly important for society as a whole, but also for this regenerative movement. So it was the first topic we chose to pick and, um, and wrestle with it, with this desire to understand why this technology is profound, what it is, and how it can be used in service of a, a more regenerative society, a more regenerative economy. So with that, um, uh, let me also just briefly share how I know Jessica and Charlie. Um, Jessica was in uh, our course and I, uh, she, she facilitated and led a number of crypto type uh, conversations sort of around the sidelines of the course. And I wasn't able to participate in as many as, as I wanted, but she quickly became, emerged as kind of one of the crypto gurus of the, um, uh, of the, of the cohort. And so um, I was delighted to invite her here today. Um, there's a woman named Kate Bennett who is not here because it's middle of the night in Australia, but she was also very active in that uh, community and, and uh, reconnected me with Jessica. So Jessica, thanks for, for joining us. And you'll all learn her background is extremely wide extremely broad across technology. Um, Charlie is an old friend, um, um, known as a leader of the impact investment space, but uh, I had to remind him that his bio needed to include the fact that he used to be the chief technology officer of Ariba, and Ariba was one of the rock star dot-com B2B marketplace companies back in the good old days of 2000, 2001. Uh, Charlie had the brilliant wisdom to sell some or all of his Ariba shares <laughs> when, it was, when the time was right and um, uh, has since uh, moved with great passion into the impact investment uh, space, but is um, uh, a, a very uh, senior and, and thoughtful technologist uh, prior to that. So really great to have him here. Um, there's some people in the audience, I can see Monty already that are you know as, as uh, younger than my oldest kid and know more about refi than I'll ever know. Um, but this conversation is going to be more high level, more conceptual than, and, than dropping into the weeds and the details of what's happening in the marketplace. So it's in a sense designed for the old folks like me to try to grasp how this movement, uh, this new language uh, in technology will profoundly affect the things that we all care about. So, that's what we're up to today. And um, maybe as a way to start, I, I would just, if I could ask you, Jessica, just to help us all understand this landscape just very briefly, um, you, you know, the, the terminology, the, the, the meaning, uh, why is blockchain profound? Why is, what, hap what is crypto? What is Web3? Just give us a, a quick sketch if you can. Oh, well, John, we have less than an hour at this point. <laughs> yeah, give um, us the five minute version. Sure. Okay. Well, I'll do my best. So, at the at the start, it's it's fair to say that Web three is is an umbrella term, uh, and it's encompasses many different concepts around sort of the future of the internet, uh, with the vision of enabling greater economic benefit and participation 
to, you know, across participants to, to a wider set of, of constituents. Um, how does it do that? Blockchain is kind of the underlying architecture or the underlying assumption of Web3 as a, as a space. Blockchain, as many of you may know, is, is essentially an advancement in record keeping. It's a, a, a ledger, but a distributed ledger in which transactions, which can be monetary, but also interactions of all sorts, um, are recorded across a network. So not just a single centralized entity, but they are recorded across and verified by that network. So Web3 is, is essentially envisioning an internet enabled by blockchain, and that has all sorts of different kind of subcomponents. Um, you've probably heard of crypto. Uh, that's maybe uh, the buzzword of, of what brought you here. This crypto is, is one of several different types of digital assets uh, under which, or, or blockchain underpins those assets. You might have also heard of non-fungible tokens or NFTs, or generally tokens of all sorts. Um, digital assets sit on top of blockchains. Um, you might have also heard of decentralized autonomous organizations or DAOs. Uh, these are essentially groups of people, a collective, if you like, of members that hold tokens that share a common goal. And so the kind of breakthrough here is that collectively using the distributed nature of blockchain, um, but the fact that logic is encoded into, into the, the ledger, they can vote or collectively manage or decide on a project, decide on governance of a project. That's kind of the breakthrough of a decentralized autonomous organization. Um, just as one quick orientation, I'll share and forgive I'm no designer, but just to kind of offer some orientation. If I just talked about this umbrella term and digital assets sitting on top of blockchain and distributed autonomous organizations, we're also getting a lot of new data. You might have heard of the Internet of Things. This is bringing in data from all sorts of, you know, traditionally offline or physical things. Us as humans, uh, the land, you might have heard of agricultural technology, um, you know, devices, our vehicles, buildings, infrastructure, industrial automation, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. So data is a big part of the, the Internet of Things is a big part of what's drawing in data to this blockchain and, and the idea of Web3 using more physical assets. And then you've probably heard of artificial intelligence, which is all about learning uh, and, and mimicking the patterns of humans using that data. So I'll pause there. We can definitely get into kind of what do we, why do we care about blockchain? But this is at the very start of kind of orientation of what are we talking about with all the, the, the lingo bingo in the tech space? Hopefully that. Yeah, that's, that was, that was perfect. And, and uh, maybe we'll keep the, the visual at, at, at sure. our hand at our ready. Um, <laughs> The other thing I, I think is true, I mean, I remember, uh, it's kind of interesting, the, the woman that invented credit default swaps on planet Earth was a colleague of mine, uh, and this would have been back in the mid-19, call it 1995 is a guess, roughly, and um, quite interestingly, she left uh, the bank to go off and run a blockchain technology company that was going to move loan trading onto the blockchain. And that had to be, I don't, I don't know, but a long time ago. So the point is this is blockchain technology is not suddenly brand new out of nowhere. This has been happening for a while. And maybe Charlie, can you like, why is this suddenly crashed onto the scene when it's sort of 10, a 10 year, a 10 year in, in the making, maybe more emerging technology. What, what's, What's happened recently that's caused this to be in, in the headlines all the time? Yeah, uh, thanks, John. And just, um, you know, I'm so um, excited to be here with all of you today. And thanks for inviting me and to the whole team and uh, looking forward to our conversation and the dialogue with uh, Jessica and all of you. So, um, you know, when I reflect, John, and everybody else on how I came into this space, right? It also started uh, way back, not just AI, but also the way that the internet works and what's enabled and what Jessica told us about, you know, what can be done now with the uh, very new technology. 
And I left Silicon Valley in 2002 because it was not really uh, catering to my desire to go deeper into the purpose of my own life and the energy there you know, is quite uh, cutthroat and not necessarily um, aligned with the desire to make a deep impact for humanity and the planet. But I came back to Silicon Valley, you know, four years ago. What changed? Well, I heard that there's a bunch of uh, new entrepreneurs, you know, that are looking at this technology, not only to make money, but really go back to the roots of where blockchain and, and, and associated technologies are coming from. And that's really to make a very big difference in control structures, in moving away from centralized control structures to really distributed control structures. And like any new technology, including the ones that I was privileged to participate in in Silicon Valley, when new technologies first uh, come to the scene, right? Um, everybody's hyped up about it, uh, which happened to crypto a few years ago and then follows the predictable crash, which just happened again you know, in the last year. And I'm a believer, and we can explore that um, a little bit more, that there is some fundamental differences underlying that will enable a few, um, not just applications, but way of doing things differently that, that, that have to do with principles behind systems, including living system principles. And so um, that has changed, right? We, we, we have, we, we were, blessed with a new technology, then we uh, overhyped it. And then um, we went into crypto winter. And uh, soon we're going to get out of that. And I'm one who actually wants to move beyond crypto big time and include uh, impact into the future and look forward to talking about that, which mm -hmm. will lead to ultimately awareness and consciousness. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Beautiful. You know, it's Charlie, as you're speaking, I'm thinking about how in many ways web three as a concept and even blockchain is, is as much a kind of philosophical reaction or transition uh, as it is a technological one. And if mm. you think, you know, often people say, well, web, web one was about, you know, reading things. Suddenly we had all this content on the internet that we could go read, okay? But a very kind of distributed, it was all over the place. Web two became all about um, writing. Now we can participate and interact and like things and share things. And that seemed like this democratization, but we also saw an immense consolidation of power, of monopolization of data, of information asymmetry, of frankly, following all of the same playbooks of amassing as much data or data as the new oil, digital wealth to extract if not natural resources, behavioral resources. So follow the same playbook, ended up with a lot of major centralized entities where yes, we can contribute and interact, but actually we lost a lot of control, digital privacy, digital surveillance. The surveillance economy generally is, is part of the reaction or mm -hmm. that is part of what has brought about kind of web three as a, how can we better distribute the value of the internet um, and it is often if if read and then write the third kind of verb that's often associated with Web three is own, and that own. is yet to be fully kind of envisioned uh, or you know manifested. But the idea is that by hashing or uh, registering something immutably onto a blockchain, you create a kind of um, you know a deed. You create a kind of proof that something happened or that this existed or I am who I say I am or I own this particular thing. And that is a fundamental difference, but part of it is technological and part of it is a real kind of reaction to the direction that the internet has taken at a very consolidated, very highly capitalized and highly, you know, monopolized. And, and this is, is you know, the, the, oh, sorry. I, just to jump in, I think it's interesting yeah. um, that that's happening at the moment, I mean, I, I blame Wall Street on the loss of trust in society. I think when the history books are written, the greatest sin of the financial crisis will be the kind of nail in the coffin for, the, for trust in the institution of finance. And the you know, fake news, lack of trust in all institutions seems to have accelerated since then. Now, certainly there were, there was lost trust that predated the financial crisis, but that just, you know, trust is at the heart of, of the 
of the monetary system of, 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 of a banking system and for the behavior of Wall Street to be as profoundly egregious as it was, it just seemed to, um, you know, it just seemed to end any notion of trust in institutions. And, and that led to me directly to the, uh, the rise of Trump, the rise of Brexit, and now the rise of authoritarianism. So on the one hand, this potential for distributed um, uh, uh, a, a distributed trust system is a response to the loss of trust. And yet, you know, it's also terrifying that we now have a society where we need to create a trust system outside of the institutions that we've set up to organize society in, in itself. Um, but I, before we move into kind of where we are and where we're going, one other um, historical fact I just wanted to bring out for everyone is the history of Bitcoin itself, which kind of, at least for many of us, that was sort of the beginning of this whole crypto thing. It was the first, you know, um, you know broadly adopted application of, of crypto on blockchain. And I, I saw Bitcoin emerge in response to the financial crisis. But actually, that's not true. It actually was created in response to the Latin American debt crisis because of the loss of trust in national currencies. So again, cause and effect, there was a very real um, collapse of an institution, which was the you know, Bretton Woods, IMF, World Bank, dollar denominated global currency system, currency regime in which development finance was constituted of lending US dollars to emerging market countries, which is systemically unsustainable and un, not resilient because you have economies that are based in local currency, building these massive foreign currency, hard currency debts and having to service interest on those debts. It's just a question of time before that that there's a, a shock and then a collapse. And that's the history of the, 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 you know, the, the boom bust cycle of emerging economies. And so Bitcoin arose in response to that. It was sort of a, we don't, we don't trust the system. And, and it, it kind of hit the mainstream after the financial crisis, but its roots were, were much earlier. So this issue of, of we no longer have trust in institutions, whether it's the money system, the financial system, the education system, government systems, um, I think is very profound. And if we're going to solve that crisis through a technological platform, the burden on doing that well is enormous. And um, um, I don't know, that, that's just my, that to me is why this is profoundly important. And it's not just some new technology that some kids in Silicon Valley are playing with. Do you guys, is that, does that make sense or? How would you respond? It all comes back to the people. <laughs> you know, <laughs> inevitably, time after time, we have seen, you know, I mean, I'm coming from the tech world uh, and, and studying lots of different technologies. And over and over and over, we see incredible breakthroughs and incredible unintended consequences. And it's not that the individuals are malicious or nefarious or bad people, but it is that we inherently incorporate our worldviews and our value systems into, you know, the technology to say nothing of metrics and how, you know, we think about measuring success. But um, that is, you know, I believe it was Sandy Wiggins who coined uh, this term tech news, but Sandy Wiggins is for, uh, as, as those um, who have participated in the, in the last couple of cohorts, led a fantastic mindfulness and meditation practice. And he's done some writing around the role of tech and, and the idea of what intention do we bring to the design of technology uh, is just as important <laughs> as the bits and as the use cases uh, or you know value propositions of the tools themselves. It's, it's inevitable and, and yet we barely have language for it. So we're gonna, there's a danger we rush to our final topic before we're ready. So let me push us back a bit. The, the, <laughs> other, the, the other theme that I think we all need to get our heads around is that what's driving, one of the themes, you know, we've talked about decentralization. There's also a general theme 
that I would use the term financialization um, that is driving this. And, and um, uh, maybe, maybe either of you, Charlie or, or, or Jessica, just talk to us about how the crypto phenomenon and the, the applications of things like NFTs are again, not really a new thing, but the latest manifestation of a trend that we could call financialization that, that frankly goes back to you know, my good old days when I was on Wall Street doing derivatives. So, um, but, but Charlie, maybe help us just grasp, get our heads around that theme. Yeah, so um, I think financialization has been a topic, again, as you point out, John, John, around for a long time. In the impact world, um, we have been fascinated and supporters of a concept called social impact bonds. And social impact bonds are, is a financial instrument that explicitly ties the financial return to proven positive or negative impact. And so we were investing in the first social impact bond in Peterborough, which was uh, trying to reduce recidivism, and it was successful in doing that. But we didn't invest in that only to reduce recidivism, but actually to co-create a new financial instrument where the financial return is, uh, is dependent on the, on the net positive impact or net negative impact, right? Mm -hmm. And our thought was if we could actually have hundreds of thousands, maybe tens of thousands of these social impact bonds, then we could securitize that, financial engineer it, put a security on top of that. And that security would then go up and down with proven impact, right? And I would make the case that that would be a systemic change play for the financial industry. And if most of the um, um, equities would actually work that way, that we would um, come a lot closer to a world where um, positive impact is baked into the financial system. Now it didn't work at scale for many different reasons, including the difficulties of measuring and proving impact, the difficulties and, uh, and to, to work with, um, with uh, policy, uh, politics and, and, and all of that. And that's where I think that actually tokenization of impact is a future model that I think we can and should develop where to Jessica's first um, comments, you know, if we create digital assets, they're not just pure speculation like uh, cryptocurrencies, but actually are tied to proven positive impact. And number two, if there were a marketplace or if we could develop a marketplace around that, well, then we would have solved a bunch of systemic issues that have to do with some of the um, living system principles, John, that you have been innovating around, like you know, being in right relationship or robust circulation or moving from shareholder to stakeholder. I think all these things can be enabled, but notwithstanding the small constraint that not all impact can be digitalized, right? And maybe we can talk about that as well at the end or later, uh, because if that, this, my argument only holds true for the, for the impact that can actually be digitalized and where we can then integrate it into a marketplace, as you pointed out before. Mm. Yeah, um, I'll chime in a little on that. I think you know this question of financialization is is a perfect example of uh, kind of the the coin, one side of the coin and the other side of the coin. On the one hand, in the blockchain space, just the fact that you know these digital assets and tokenization enables alternative currencies, alternative money systems where individuals or groups can come together and um, essentially encode different intentions into currency. Um, this is expanding the Overton window of what money is and how we are thinking about money. It's very early days, but that in and of itself is huge, is part of potentially a, a whole redefinition of not just thinking about money as a one trick pony of what's the goal of money to amass more wealth, <laughs> but what's the goal of money to stay in circulation to, you know, accomplish <laughs> or enact goals. And those goals can go in lots of different directions. Now they can be for, you know, uh, carbon tracking or, 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 you know, all sorts of different regenerative outcomes, or they can be for, you know, manipulation and behavioral manip manipulation. I mean, one of the big questions 
um, some of my clients and I are, are really tackling is, you know, if you think about tokenization and say a customer loyalty program, are you essentially extracting from customers by having every interaction, every like, every click, every brand interaction um, stripped of any value, but instead kind of um, underlied with a financial incentive? What do we, do we want an internet in which everything is financialized and driven by this kind of core um, desire to uh, amass more tokens? Um, so it's it's in some ways two sides of the same coin, pun intended. <laughs> yeah, it's it's fa it's fascinating uh, to me, and and um, again here, well, first I'll say um, uh, Bernard Leotard, who is no longer. Um, breathing on this planet, but a, a giant in the in the thinking about currency and the use of alternative currencies uh, late in his life was super excited about the possibilities of, of blockchain. And, um, and I'm sure I would agree, Jessica, with everything you just said about the two sides of the of the coin. Um, so I, you know, I think this, I agree with you that this opportunity for alternative and complementary currencies is, is profoundly important in creating incentive systems through our economy that are more aligned with outcomes that we need, uh, we, we both need and desire. And um, this financialization terrifies me because there's a, um, there's a, there's a slippery slope to um, the, the assumption of fungibility. So once you've created a unit of something, then what's the unit of that something worth vis-a-vis -vis dollars or vis-a-vis -vis yen or any other currency? And, um, you know, the, the, this, the, 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 the challenge of, of getting the benefit out of these tools without, um, sort of sliding into this, sliding down the slippery slope of um, of not recognizing that not all value is fungible and the most important value things that we really care about is for sure not fungible um, like you know you can get a life insurance policy on your spouse or yours or or anybody and that puts a value a monetary value on their life but no one would confuse that monetary value as fungible with the life. And, um, and as we start using these technologies to try to uh, manage climate crisis or ecosystem service um, protection, um, you know, as soon as it becomes financialized and monetized, there's a there's a there isn't a requirement that that you know it go to the highest bidder, but if we don't design these tools carefully, um, it's inevitable that they will move to um, uh, you know be controlled by the highest bidder. And Peter Brown, who is one of my early teachers, uh, who is a philosophy um, a philosopher by training has a great way of saying it, which is that there's a, there's a difference between something that between a, a, a uh, cost that can be fixed with money and a wrong that can never be fixed. And so at any rate, I guess, you know, may, maybe this is a good way to, um, and, and by the way, the financialization of mortgage securities, um, if you think about the experience of the financial crash, um, you know, there were economists running around talking about this term uh, market completion, which I'd never heard of before. And the idea of that was to move um, more and more um, uh, things, activities, uh, relationships, exchanges onto, into, financial, into the financial markets with the idea that that would make them more efficient. And therefore, um, that would be good for economic growth and therefore good for prosperity. And the, you know, think of the fallout of, of financializing mortgages so that when they crashed, the, the, the ripple effects caused, you know, a generation of families to be put out on the street. 
and caused you know European economies to collapse. Um, so anyway, I find this financialization trend a very um, dangerous one that I don't think we, including how I just bl blabbed about it without being very articulate, I don't think we have our heads around how to think about where financialization is good and where it's dangerous and how to control that. And, and, you know, John, I think that you mentioned that if we were maybe a paraphrase a little bit more careful with uh, designing the financialization, maybe that would be partially alleviating some of the pitfalls. I don't think so. You know, I think uh, the design of technology usually enables both terrorists to take advantage of the, it and angels, you know, uh, with, uh, with Steve Jobs, I I managed uh, to develop an operating system, which is now Apple's OS, and that is used by bad people and by good people, right? And I think um, the same will be true for anything that we design. And that's why I think that without, and that's true for even mindfulness, right? I do believe that we have a consciousness crisis for humanity. And unless we realize that we are part of the universe and not outside of it, that we don't have the, the authority to control nature because we are part of it. Unless we really change that and wake up to that uh, fact that even intellectually uh, makes sense, right? Not just um, spiritually, that, uh, that technology will be misused. I'm kind of uh, terrified by you know, the potential for not being able to track people anymore with Web3, if we implement it fully decentralized, unless we get that upgrade or, or work on ourselves to actually um, uh, realize what responsibility comes with that. Mm -hmm. And that's, um, so I hope that in the next few years, we don't have that much time, you know, that we will, we will wake up to the fact and particularly the technologists and uh, to, to to but not only right because um, it, it's it's all about the usage patterns and what we use for even for and that's the last point because I've thought about this a lot in my own life you know in for my own personal transformation and my mindfulness you know people actually, um, actually hey Charlie before yeah. you go there where I'm gonna I'm, I, I definitely want to land there but before we get to this let me um, let me just push us back uh a little bit um and and um and then we'll we'll end on this whole consciousness piece which i i agree is is profoundly important but um, i'm just keeping an eye on the clock um maybe just at, may, let me ask you uh since you raise steve's name uh this is sort of a quick anecdote question but what would he be thinking doing saying were he with us today watching the crypto winter and FTX and yet all the creative potential. Where where would he be on this topic? Yeah, I'm 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 missing Steve on that level, right? Because he would definitely do it differently than all the big philanthropists of our time. He would actually question the validity of that particular system because he always questioned these systems. He would not just copy the old way of philanthropy and scale it up. It clearly doesn't work to solve the big systemic issues of our times. And he would, uh, he would, he would, he would challenge us all on that, and he would probably invent a new thing that I don't know how how to do, right? Um, yeah. And uh, and and we're we're doing that on small scale, and then if uh, Microsoft would actually copy that, like they did in their in their business lives, right, uh, <laughs> and scale up, and scale up something that is more impactful as opposed to the old way of philanthropy, then we would at least make some progress. But what about other than philanthropy? What would he? What, how would he engage in this crypto? Oh, in the crypto, right? Yeah. Yeah. Well, you know, um, again, you know, I built what, what 128 encryption into um, OpenStep at the time, and the NSA uh, didn't allow us to uh, export the machines into uh, Soviet Union at the time because it took like three months to, de to, to, to just decrypt it, right? And I think that he would, um, he would, he, he would push the envelope again on all these, uh, on, on all these efforts. But he also had his dark sides, right? He was not, a, he, he was a genius for sure, but he was a very conflicted person uh, personally with respect to his legacy and with respect to his, his contribution, right? And so I, I, I would have to speculate, but certainly he would do things differently than we do today. <laughs> Fair enough. And Jessica, if I could ask you before we, before we move on to the 
ethical ethics consciousness piece where we'll we'll end. Um, can you share with us just your perspective on what is now called refi? Um, you know, it's interesting when I first used that term, I didn't know it was a thing. I I think there's a refi regenerative finance that can be done with you know, web one, web two, good old fashioned US dollars, um, you know, traditional finance. And, and, and I call that regenerative finance. But uh, it seems to me in my limited understanding, you know, particularly with the, the, um, the rise of, of token, if I'm pronouncing it correctly, protocol, there's a big move toward using the blockchain to work on climate through um, uh, carbon credits. And maybe you could just share your perspective on what's happening in that space. And is, you know, you now know what, what I mean when I say regenerative economics. Is there anything regenerative yet happening in the refi space in your mind? Sure. Um, well, I mean, first, kind of a little grounding. It, it's so interesting that regenerative finance, you know, did exist or the concept existed before crypto and then crypto kind of took it over um, in some ways as a response to decentralized finance, which is known as DeFi in the crypto space, refi became this sort of counter argument to it. Um, and so, but I mean, the general idea is that we can use finance to regenerate people, individuals, you know, economic outcomes, um, environmental outcomes, the health of the planet and biodiversity. It's this idea that, as, as we were kind of getting at before, that currency itself, in this case, digital currency, can be encoded into and used, you know, that that the that the logic of the system can be to replenish and regenerate these, these XYZ outcomes. Um, I'll share real quick uh, another, I just found this, this is a, essentially a market map of all of these different um, projects and um, you know protocols and Web three organizations around this, and you can see like a lot of them. There, it's often uh, associated with climate, but it also gets into all sorts of areas around universal basic income or lending or you know remittances, um, social impacts at a very local level. There are really interesting projects around. Yeah, like all sorts of different kind of economic um, benefits that are very localized. So like a localized currency in a particular region that is using, um, you know, the digital capability because it streamlines it, but is not a, a kind of global project, but for which global crypto philanthropists or investors can buy in and, and, and pay into the system. Um, but it is a growing space. It's a very large space. Um, are there, you know, examples today of this happening? Absolutely. It's happening at a fairly small scale, but this idea essentially of sort of putting a price on, um, you know, externalities by incorporating them into the blockchain and, and rewarding those who create positive externalities is definitely taking shape. There's, um, you know, there's a there's an organization called Power Ledger, um, which is is utilizing blockchain for like distributed energy systems. Um, there's all sorts of examples around transparency and supply chain, like in you know fishing and, and agriculture and all sorts of different areas like that. Uh, Toucan is a pretty well known protocol um, around carbon capture. Uh, there's one called Seeds, I believe, that is again allowing folks to buy in. Um, and then essentially use their tokens to uh, assert their will, if you like, in different directions towards reforestation projects, towards um, all sorts of different kind of regenerative outcomes, biodiversity replenishment and so forth. Mm -hmm. um, there's also a, a, a example called Giveth that I think is very interesting. This is essentially a um, a platform for anyone to donate to a set of a, a wide range of different causes by donating you get kickbacks if you if you pool your money there through what's called staking you get even more kickbacks because it creates liquidity and there's there's all sorts of experiments happening yeah with all sorts of different positive intentions uh you know and and, and systems associated with them so Kick, kickbacks in a good way in a good way we hope <laughs> yeah well, it's there's there's more than we have time to to talk about, and and I I noticed in the in the chat someone was was reminding me the value of being able to in a sense print your own currency, which I totally agree with, 
you know, we've learned through the quantitative easing, the power of, you know, major governments being able to print money for, for, for what, for different purposes. And imagine if we can harness that power, it's, this is fundamental to uh, modern monetary theory, but if it can be done with citizen led quote, good initiatives, um, that solves huge problems uh, that are, that are linked to traditional financial capital locked up in very big buildings and very big portfolios that is, that, that is sort of atrophying the, the economy because of the lack of circulation as, as Charlie mentioned, but um, boy, there's a lot to wrestle with about the, what can go wrong. Um, just in, in, the, in the short amount of time before we open it up to, to everyone else, uh, Charlie, now let's go back to your consciousness and, and let me make it harder for all three of us. There's this sort of rising human consciousness that manifests in human, human ethics and ethical decisions and choices. But there's also, we talk about in the regenerative space, this need for a rising consciousness to, to remember that we are connected to something far bigger than ourselves and even humanity, that we're part of life itself. And, and, and there's, there's the reality of how life works, how the universe works. And then there's human choices about ethics and human values, which aren't necessarily in alignment um, or they don't need to be in alignment. And you know, my good ethics may be different than your good ethics, Charlie. Um, so how do we, how do we, how do you think about, how do both of you think about this, you know, call it the ethical consciousness shift challenge and, and where do we all, uh, if we share this view that it's important, how do, how do we, how do we even think about it, much less act on it? If that's a question. Um, <laughs> uh, oops, the idea is, uh, uh, so, so Jessica, maybe I start. Is okay? Yeah, Charlie, you jump in because I cut you off. Yeah, 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 yeah. No, no, no problem. So I was I was talking about a little bit in an analogy, you know, about using mindfulness training to do anything better, if you wish, and more focused and more um, on on target, if you wish, uh, than if you don't do that. And meditation and other mindfulness practices are a known way of, uh, of, 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 of being able to concentrate and, and, and do that. And uh, you can do that, you know, in order to, um, if you're a sharpshooter, you can use meditation to better shoot people, right? And that just shows you that mindfulness practices alone are not good enough uh, to get to a better world. And I think the only answer to your question about how to do that is actually if we include compassion and love on top of that, right? Because without this, you get quickly drawn into, as you point out, my ethics versus your ethics. Having said this, I think the every company, uh, to pull it back more to not a personal level, but the com a company level, I think every company that deploys meaningful or deeper AI needs to have an ethical charter and an ethical committee and ethical commitment, you know, what it stands for such that you know, the human control of technology, promotion of human values and well-being, fairness, and things like that are actually foremost and prime to how, how, it, how, how, how the company acts and, and, the, and, and, the, um, and the society should have ways of holding the companies accountable to that through regulatory frameworks, right, as the EU is trying to do. So it's both top down, bottom up and realizing that we need to do that and, and adding compassion and love over that. Otherwise, uh, we'll be um, victims of the incre increasingly powerful and subtle you know, uh, uh, technologies that we talked about today. Jessica, I know you, you're wrestling with this a lot with your clients. <laughs> What's, uh, where's your wisdom on this for us? Help us. Uh, I mean, I, I'll offer, you know, there's so many, so many portals around this, this topic. I think, you know, one of the areas I think a lot about is the education divide around tech and how that enables many of the abuses, so much of the obfuscation, so much of the sort of downstream externalities or negative impacts that actually we have no visibility into what's happening upstream. In other words, 
if developers and engineers are making these decisions around what goes into the code or what counts as this or that or how things are categorized, we as individuals not only have no insight into that and how therefore the technology may control or how our data is being used about us, but we don't even know how that how that works in the first place. And so I think a lot about things like, you know, not just the digital divide, but how that in and of itself exacerbates or is exacerbated by this lack of digital literacy by that we actually shouldn't have to all be technology experts to feel safe <laughs> um, or or to you know understand the risks. There's a there's a very um suspicious trend in Silicon Valley where you know many of the executives of large tech companies, their kids don't use devices. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> and and so I think that there is this sort of large gap to explore around um, education and updating our curricula and our and our kind of societal infrastructure for supporting us to be able to exercise agency when it comes to our technology as builders and as as Charlie mentioned around this idea of like a Hippocratic oath and kind of the, the responsibility of design, but also as consumers and users and you know advocates of the technology. Um, that's a huge area. Um, I could keep going forever on this, but I'll, I'll stop there. <laughs> that's huge. And I, and I, I promise we, we need to bring in some, some other voices. I, I'll make only one short comment on this, which is insufficient. But I, I feel very passionate that um, we, we're not going to agree on a set of shared ethics around this. And the temptation for people to extract and exploit is so huge. Um, you know, you're talking about creating instant, you know, look at the FTX thing. I mean, here's a kid that goes, you know, that before he got his hair cut is a, it's worth $25 billion. I mean, it's become insane. And um, uh, so I, my plea to us is to recognize that we are part of a living system that is over 4 billion years and running. And that is part of a living universe, which is 14 billion years and running. And there is a reality about how that brilliant reality works. And, and our science understands it and our science now under, is aligned with our wisdom traditions. And so rather than uh, us trying to figure out what the ethical framework is supposed to be and how to regulate it, if we could agree that aligning with how life works, living systems that have proven they are living systems, not dead systems. And, and hum, the human, human society is an example of an ever, highly evolved living system. Why wouldn't we look to those patterns and principles as our, as our North Star, as our compass, as we wrestle with these challenges? So that's my plea on this topic. But at um, any rate, Rachel, I, I know you're probably banging on me to shut up and and bring in some other voices. No, we knew this was going to be a rich discussion. So thank you, John and Jessica and Charlie. Um, it always does feel like time starts racing away there at the end where we want to hear more, but we want to include more. So we would love to take some questions. If anyone wants to raise their hand, um, then we'd just like to welcome your voice into the space. Questions or or even better insights, um, but in in lieu of the time, please do keep it brief. There we go. Hi, we have Hi. I'm Roseanne. I have a question, John. I want to build on what you just said, and I think like the question that everyone's like the underlying question is like what can go wrong, and what can go right, right? And so at the end of the day, like we're human and we keep repeating history. And there's, and when you talk about like living systems and it's been around for 14 billion years and you know, there's this wisdom. So when we take, you were talking about like, there's this, look at us, we do this boom and then we do this bust. So like what, you know, here's this, this new emerging technology, right? We've had plenty of new emerging technologies in our human history with like the printing press, right? Or like automation, right? And so if we can look back, is anyone looking at history of just how humans kind of respond to these things, you know, to say like, here's how we could actually, you know, just using those as like guideposts of like, here's where we could go 
as a human species, you know, where it could go good and where it could go bad. So it's just, I wanted to kind of throw that out because there is this big question. And I think we're trying to more focus on wrapping our heads around the technology versus wrapping our heads around us. So uh, it's a question to know if anyone's looking at that. I don't know the answer to that question. I don't know if Jessica um, or Charlie does. I, I think the I think you could look at any technology from the plow to the printing press to the automobile, and you and and you would find a pattern, which is we were trying to solve a problem, but we did it with a reductionist mindset, not a holistic understanding of the context that the problem existed within. So the shift from reductionist thinking to holistic thinking is at the heart of figuring out how to get it right rather than wrong, in, in my opinion. Um, and I will quickly add to that, that you need, we all need to work on our own personal transformation to get a better insight of who we really are as a human being and not as our brains or our hearts. Hmm. I'll just say, Roseanne, you you articulated well this book idea I've had for a long time. Yeah, background is good. in anthropology, and I think that there are amazing lessons looking across human history around our adaptation to technology, just as relevant today with emerging blockchain tech as it was, you know, exactly. with the photo, the printing press. We can keep on. Only, going. only I think the dangers are bigger. That the exponential upside and downside are are well, the upside and downside are now exponential as opposed to linear. So, yeah. Michael, jump in. Thanks, Roseanne. Can I ask Michael oh, and sorry. Chris, maybe we take two questions at once, and then I think we'll have to wrap up after that. But yeah, Chris and Michael, are you still there? Yeah. Sure. <laughs> Michael, go ahead. I'll just be quick. Just to, just to extrapolate on what you said there, John, with um, thinking reductionist thinking, and my main concern in refi is that a lot of the projects aren't first like aren't first dealing with the regenerative development side like we're leading sometimes as a hammer looking for a nail um bad actors are, are less dangerous in this space i think in, in in the growth um compared to people that are really well-meaning um especially in carbon markets and things like that we don't need a lot of money going into projects that are just like monocultures of fields to to extrapolate cash from carbon. So you you kind of wrapped up what I was I was going to say in your comment. Great. I just had a quick question. So amazing. Um, yeah, it came down to this question almost just ago. You guys were all touching on it, but this decentralization process, you know, data ownership, financial assets, right? And then almost how that relates to AI in our future. So I was kind of curious. Maybe you guys could that briefly, but like almost like future democracy at high level and um, you know, in the frame of AI and how can we follow up from here? Thanks, guys. Thanks, everyone. Oof. <laughs> That's a big one. Um, hard to sure. say for now. I think we have more work to do on the um, human and coming together side uh, before the AI and the data comes in. Although there are some very interesting examples. Um, Taiwan, Estonia come to mind around using data and, and also blockchain um, to, to better facilitate kind of bottom up governance, bottom up ideation and, and using, you know, data and, and learning analysis to, to make that faster and easier, but early days. Charlie, any thoughts on that? Yeah, yeah, I, I think there is a huge development with respect to impact management, blockchain and uh, AI, right? So if we actually put uh, impact events on a blockchain, then you can get all the benefits from that they actually occurred and, and what have you, the additional, additionality and attributability, which is uh, our big problems. And then as we collect uh, with IoT and other uh, sensors, all these uh, outputs in, in impact management jargon, the impact events, then we can deploy AI to really analyze that data and gain insights that are um, insights not only for making more money, but insights actually for impact. And those things are going on right now with uh, projects like Rainfall and Proof of Impact and others You know that I've invested in and I am on the board of. And I'm very, very, um, very positively um, hopeful that uh, these efforts will make a significant contribution to that emerging field of actually measuring impact. But with its, with its limitation that I talked about before, but if we can actually measure the impact and make, make it digital, then you can deploy all these wonderful technologies to actually you know, um, uh, not just analyze it, but then gain knowledge from that that we would otherwise not see. 
One thing I would just add um, is, is a plug for Jeremy Lent's book, um, The Web of Meaning. He does a brilliant job in one of the sections about explaining that the human mind is not a computer and that AI will never replace the human mind. And um, I, won't, I won't try to expand on it given our time, but, but highly recommend his work. Um, it's profoundly important around this question of the, the future. And, and Rachel, if I can um, usurp control here for a second, I see Monty's got his hand up. And I think this conversation requires someone who uh, was born in the 21st century to, um, uh, to contribute. So Monty, please, uh, please jump in. Hello, everyone. Hi. <laughs> Good I think to in be the 21st century, am I right? <laughs> yes, indeed. It's, uh, it's super exciting to have seen this conversation unfold and it really go from first principle. I think it's it's been an amazing conversation and I love the way it's been uh, kind of explained and approached. And um, yeah, I just wanted to express some gratitude there um, and also say that, that some of the work we're doing right now is actually taking these awesome regenerative frameworks, such as what you've built yourself, John, uh, including some other ones like Kate Raworth's uh, Donut Economics, our actual principles of implementing those in the real world, some thinking uh, from John Elkington, um, some regenerative organizational design principles, taking all of these amazing frameworks that the kind of hardcore professionals and have been working on for many years and, and, and actually seeing how we can apply that to this emerging ecosystem. I think because we're seeing this huge explosion in interest around this refi space, there's a hugely important um, need to actually assess these projects and make sure that the good actors are the ones that are actually being promoted and the scammy, overly financialized kind of extractive uh, attention that it's inevitably going to get this year. Uh, we can actually have ways of, of filtering that out a little bit and really focusing on the projects in refi that are the most regenerative to their core uh, and generally true to those values. So yeah, I'm super excited to to work on that over the coming weeks and, uh, and work with uh, some of the awesome people on this call. So yeah, I just want to say it's hugely grateful that this is, conversation has happened. And yeah, I look forward to uh, to working with people in the future. Great. Thanks, Monty. Mm -hmm. Thanks, Monty. Right, Rachel, over thanks, to you. Thanks, John. Thanks for all the reflections and, and questions. I know we're at time now. I can't say top of the hour because it started hot fast. But thank you, everyone, for your time. I know it's early for some. There was some in Sydney, Australia, and later for others um and others that are still getting to their day so thank you for taking the time to be here i just want to make some announcements before we wrap up so as it's been mentioned we have our introduction to regenerative economics course and our new cohort starts on march the 13th we are also offering scholarship applications so please check that out on our website we'll share a link we'll also have a finance course that's coming up this year so just stay tuned to our social media or website we'll be making announcements and we want to continue this conversation so we're going to share a linkedin um, link into the chat to continue just engaging with questions and um, we'll jump in there as well so please check out the link linkedin link and then also this is our first uh, monthly discovery dialogue we intend to be doing these once a month so it'll be the fourth Thursday of the month, the next one, the 23rd of Feb. So please stay tuned for that. And we'll let you know the topic um, and guest speakers. So yeah, with that, I just want to say thank you and respect everybody's time. We look forward to seeing you next time. Mm -hmm.